Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the webinar today. I am Will, and this is our microfiche scanning costs webinar. Uh, just a quick note before I get started, there's some uh, repair work being done. So if you hear some sawing or some hammering, I apologize. Just bad timing on uh, the day this is happening. But let's keep moving forward here. So the purpose of today's webinar is first, we want you to understand the cost factors and how they can affect your digital conversion project. Have a baseline for the, the price you're gonna pay or the total project costs for your microfiche. And of course, if you have any questions, get your questions answered. There's a lot of information available, especially on our website, our YouTube channel, but there's typically a, a number of questions that are specific to your project. Feel free to ask them and hopefully I can get them answered for you today. Quick nuts and bolts, some housekeeping. If you can hear me, could you please raise your hand in the uh, the Zoom um, little column over there so I can see that folks can actually hear me. Perfect, I see some hands going up. Thank you very much. And then if you click the hand again, it'll go down. And then could you raise your hand if you can see my screen? So my video is showing as well as my screen that says nuts and bolts. That would, uh, that would let me know that you can see it. Excellent, I see at least a few people, so it's working. Thank you very much. Uh, you are muted, you're not in video, so please, where the you know, raising your hand and all that stuff is, just use the little chat tool there, the, uh, the question and answer tool. Ask your questions along the way. If I see them while I'm discussing the topic, I will try to answer them when I see them, or at the minimum, there's a little time at the end that I will answer them there and make sure I didn't miss anything. But go ahead and answer or excuse me, ask questions along the way if something interesting that you want to learn about pops up. With that said, let's get right into it. I'm sure you're all wondering right off the bat, how much does microfiche scanning cost? Just a ballpark. But we'll, we'll talk about the different types of fiche coming up. But in general, jacket microfiche, 16 and 35 millimeter, roughly between 90 cents to $1.25 per fiche. That means per sheet of micro microfiche, like the actual physical sheet, not the images. If you have com microfiche, maybe around three to five dollars. But it absolutely depends on your project and what you need done and how many you have and some other factors that we are going to dive into in this webinar. So those are good ballparks, but it will depend on your unique situation, your unique requirements and project. Continuing on, what is microfiche? These sheets of microfilm that were, well, depending on the type, this is a jacket microfiche. So actually you can see these little channels here. There's a channel there. This is called ch five channel jacket fiche, 16 millimeter. So they're sheets of images, some of which like jacket fiche, fiche were actually strips of microfilm that were then cut and then slid into those channels. There's also 35 millimeter jacket fiche, which we'll see. But then there are other types uh, that we'll go into in the next slide. Basically, microfiche is reduced size images on a sheet, sheet of fiche. And they're about four by six inches, the standard size. There are some different sizes, but four by six inches. So again, roughly that big. All the different types are around that. There are some variations there. So the actual cost factors of what your price will either go up or go down from. So you have that baseline. The, the number one factor, that's why it's number one on the list, but also just, I believe it's number one of the cost is how many sheets you actually have. That's essential to your scope because if you have one sheet that you want to get scanned, that's completely different than if you had 250,000, much different type of project. So at BMI, we consider a small project to be something below about 5,000 physical sheets of microfiche. Again, not images, the actual physical uh, unit. A medium project, these are kind of ballpark numbers, up to about 20,000-ish. Again, it's, it's a decent sized project, but again, based on what we, the types of projects we typically run, that's about a medium size. And then large would be 20,000 plus. Now we have seen many that are 100,000, you know, 80, 90, 100,000. Some we've seen that are multiple hundreds of thousands and even more. So Anything above that 20,000 kind of gets towards the large size, but it's all very kind of gray in the middle. You know, is, is a 6,000 sheet project a small project? You know, still kind of compared to what though? Compared to other things, but anything below 5,000 is a bit on the small side. And then above that is kind of the more standard project. 
but the number of sheets will be very much uh, a factor in what your price is because if you have if you're on the smaller uh, the the lesser quantity side, you're going to be closer or above that kind of one twenty five ish per sheet. If you say you have three hundred thousand sheets, you're going to be closer to that ninety cents a piece, maybe a little below, maybe a little above. Again, there's some other factors that will apply, but that range is going to be very much based on how many you have. Type of fiche is important as well. A couple different formats, styles. As I mentioned, we have the uh, jacket fiche. This is a 16 millimeter jacket. So this was 16 millimeter film. that was then put into these jackets. 35 millimeter jacket, which are going to be things like oversized drawings, engineering drawings, maybe uh, photographs that were you know, microfilmed at, uh, from books, things like that. So large format documents are typically the 35 millimeter. You can kind of see it here. It's very, very faint. You can actually see the channels in the background there. So you can see how there was 35 millimeter film slipped into that jacket. You have step and repeat fiche, which I don't have on screen. We have COM, which stands for computer output microfilm. So interestingly enough, COM microfiche were originally digital images. So computer output that were then created as microfilm or microfiche. So it's computer output microfilm, already digitized images put on microfiche, just an interesting concept, but that's what they are. They look like that. That's why they're all very uh, consistent. You know, a lot of just text and data because coming from old computers back in the 70s and 80s mostly. So there's all text-based data on a sheet and you have about 270, 300 images on there. And this is an image of an oversized sheet. I, I believe... There are roughly around three by seven inches, four by seven inches. So they're larger than the other types of microfiche. These are all four by six. These are oversized. They require different style of scanning, sometimes different machines based on uh, the size of them because there are some variations. Reduction ratio is important. You, the higher reduction ratio, the more images you have. So typically on 16 millimeter microfilm and microfiche, you'll see a 24x reduction ratio. That means if you have an original document like, you know, sheets of paper, eight and a half by 11 page, the image on the microfiche, so one of these little guys here, is 24 times reduced from the original. So if you blew it up 24 times, you'd have the original size. If you have 48x, you're going to get about twice as many images on there, which would then be you have a lot, you basically have double the amount of images. That takes more processing, a little bit longer to scan, hence that could affect your price. Uh, Confish also has different reduction ratios. So some of those you can have, typically it's 270, 300 images, but you could have 50% more on there if you have a higher reduction ratio. Just a lot of scanning, a lot of image processing. So that will affect your price. The image layout is important. It seems, you know, they're, they're, Many different ways you can you can have uh, microfiche images laid out, but let's take this jacket microfiche. We may receive, let's say it's a 10,000 uh, sheets for a project, but if depending on how they were loaded, it may require different scanning because we find sometimes this strip of microfilm was maybe loaded upside down or they're all loaded backwards. So instead of these being right reading, maybe they were loaded like this, but then the sheet was flipped around and the title is right reading, but on the back side, that makes all the images not right reading, at least compared to the title, which then has to be dealt with or somehow uh, remedied before the digital images get you know, put on a file for you because you don't want backwards reading images. Sometimes if they're not full strips, like actually here you see that's a different strip. You can see it's not the same strip as this. Some images might be right reading, some might be upside down, rotated, backwards, mirrored, all different variations, typically with jacket fish, that have to be dealt with. And that can affect your price if we need to go in there and manipulate the images. It's not always required. Some folks don't mind if it's like that because you can always rotate PDFs or something. If you're using, let's say, our application, our digital real application, you can manipulate the images within there. So it may not matter, but if you do want that fixed or adju adjudicated, it may be a additional price. And I have a question here. Let me just check. Uh, ask me like, will I cover microfilm at all? Not microfilm kind of as its own, um, discussion. So previously I did do a microfilm scanning cost, uh, webinar. 
the costs are very much similar. So you'll have number of roles, type of film, uh, naming and indexing. We'll get into that later. So very similar factors, but this is specifically for microfiche, although the, the, the idea is very similar. So not microfilm specifically during this webinar. All right, what else? Number of images I mentioned, the reduction ratio can affect that, or you may just have the you know, certain type of confiche that has a certain number of images. You may have jacket fiche that is half full. If all the fiche are half full and we can, that's consistent for us, we may be able to give you a different price knowing that only the, you know, let's say the top two or three strips are full of images. Again, there are variations in there how that can be effect, uh, can affect the price but it's going to depend on your unique fiche. And then the quality. That can be an issue, especially with the jacket fiche, if it's not a duplicate, if it's an original, where you can actually pull those strips in and out, because we have seen microfiche, that uh, the, the, the channels are sort of falling apart, images are hanging out, or they're, they're, they're barely in there, maybe we receive a box of material and they're just all the fish they have pieces images on the on the bottom of the box that have been falling out that's poor quality fish and they're not kept properly that could be something if we have to deal with that or maybe reload the images into a different jacket an actual a, a nice jacket sometimes we have to do that reload the images that can absolutely affect your price resolution so resolution is basically the the dots per inch is DPI or pixels per inch really. And the dots per inch is more from photographic days, but that's just kind of stuck. It's really pixels per inch with digital imaging, but basically how many pixels per square inch are on the image. And that's going to be how kind of fine the image is. So 300 DPI is the standard. That is 99.5% of projects, 99.9% .9 of projects we do is 300 DPI. I have seen, I've done, a 400 DPI project was actually for microfilm, but that is going to be a slower process because you're getting a more, a higher resolution image. It's going to take longer scan. And it's not just a little bit longer. It can take 50% to two times longer to scan that same sheet of microfiche, which does affect the price. It's taking longer to do the same thing that would have been done at 300. 600 DPI plus is what we tell folks is you probably don't need it unless it's an absolute uh, like a, a specific regulation or requirement, maybe part of uh, like some sort of research project that has to be done a certain way. Sometimes folks ask for it just because they think, hey, larger DPI must be better. Again, you got to think, what am I going to use these for? Unless it's for, again, there's some sort of regulation or a specific research project is requiring that. 300 DPI is going to be fantastic. We actually do like lab notebooks. You need to be able to see those drawings and notes that folks take uh, when they're doing their, their science and their research, 300 DPI, even on lab notebooks, you can get absolutely great images from that as long as the original material is good quality as well. So, and this is the standard, very rare that we do anything uh, different than that, but it is an option. It just, the higher DPI, it will affect your price. Now, indexing, digital file naming is another way of saying that. And I believe in within uh, within BMI, we believe that, you know, Number of sheets is an essential element. That's going to be a huge factor for your price. Indexing is another factor. It's one of the larger ones because if the more complex you get, typically the more pricey you get. So you can be very low key, very simple. Indexing you can be very granular. And I'll show you a couple of examples here. The simplest, most cost effective is the fiche level, which means let's say you have 10,000 of these. I said fiche level indexing. We're going to scan the images individually. Let's say we're making multi-page PDF. So this will be a six-page PDF file because you have six images. We'll name it by this title. And in most cases, it's just as is. So we will name it top to bottom, left to right, however you designate. But let's say it's called subdivision, survey maps, underscore, book 83, page 62 through page 67, dot PDF. That's your title level indexing. Very simple. And most importantly, I think, is it replicates your records as they exist now. So the other thing when you go into digitization, you can get really fancy, uh, some really complex indexing. You say, hey, this is going to be great. Once it's digital, I can have it perfect. I can find things really simply. But you're changing how you're used to accessing the records now. 
the best thing I can recommend is you replicate as it exists, which if you need to go get a fish, you probably have them in drawers of some fashion or boxes. And you go, well, I know if I'm looking for this file, let's say I need to go to uh, cabinet number five, drawer number three, and then it's organized in some fashion. And I know I'll find this. Replicate that digitally to start. Just cross the river from analog to digital, replicate what you have, see how that works. And you can always do more later because now they're already digitized. It's very simple for someone to see the digitized images and then start doing something above and beyond from there. But if you start changing it while you're doing the digitizing, you start kind of affecting what people are used to and how they're used to finding these records, which could cause problems. Sometimes it works out great. Most often it just becomes overly complicated. People get kind of paralysis analysis. They don't know what to do. There are many exceptions that pop up. Do you want subdivision survey maps first? Do you want that at the end? Is that going to be organized? Are they all named very consistently? These are all questions that can affect that. So we recommend the building block approach. Fiche level, you can do something later if you don't find fiche level as effective as you wanted. But they're already going to be in digital, so it's going to be quicker to find them anyway. You could have, let's say, each fiche within a folder called drawer four, within a folder called cabinet two. So you can make it just replicate exactly what you do now. File level would be more granular. If you have very... One thing about fiche level too, a lot of these, when I mean, you're converting from microfiche or microfilm, like uh, one of our guests asked, 95% of these images you're never going to look at. So that's another thing. What do I want to spend on something I'm not going to be looking at too often? I mean, even if you're looking at an image a day or a file a day, if you have 10,000 or 20, 30, 40,000 fiche, that's, that could be hundreds of thousands or millions of, act, of individual images or records. Are you looking at all of them? If not, how detailed do you want to go? How much do you want to spend to get there? So that's another thing to consider that if you're not looking at these very frequently, it may not be good to get that detailed indexing unless it's required. But if you want file level, it can be good for more frequently accessed records, such as, let's say, student transcripts. This is just an example. It's not a real transcript, so no sensitive information. But this may have, let's say, there are four students on this file, and let's say it's all very consistent 100,000 uh, fiche records with multiple students, maybe instead of going to this fiche and seeing, you know, having to look through the entire document for individual students, maybe you want those four students broken out into individual files. That'd be file level indexing. So maybe this, this first row is a student. Then and maybe uh, that's, that has a student name and then you see a new student name on this one. Then we stop there, that becomes a new file until this page and that's a new file and then that's a new file so you could break that down it's just more laborious a little more resource intensive because someone's going to have to go in there and actually find out which page separates a student in the student example depending on the and we'll get to one of the factors later subcontractors but can subcontractors look this information in this case probably not because if we don't know, if it's not a, like, let's say a form or a very consistent of these blips here, if there were double level blips, kind of wider blips, fatter blips, that may indicate a new file. If that's not there, and someone has to look at each page about, okay, where's the student name? Where's the date of birth? Where's the you know, student number? Whatever it is, that's sensitive information that should not be subbed out because it's, it's PII. So... That would require internal resources to look at every single page just to find, oh, there, the name changes. It may be a 10-page file, maybe a two-page file, but I'm going to have to look at every other page until I find, oh, there's a new student. You can see how that can become pretty expensive instead of just doing a file level, excuse me, fiche level. Or maybe there is something such as, let's say this page here was some sort of very eye-readable, eye vi uh, visually identifiable form that we could say or maybe a flasher sheet just a big sheet with a, like a a one on it then right here there's a it just says a big old two and then there's a big old three and that's an indicator of here's the next student you wouldn't have to necessarily look at every image because there's that visual identifier that is saying boom this is a file this is a file this is a file that's a little simpler and it's going to be not as expensive of course of looking at every single image then you have image level again i have student records here that may come down if you not only want the student record as, hey, here's a 20-page student file, 
but you want individual sections within that file. So there may be um, like their application, their graduation record, their attendance records. That may be, even if this was one student, this whole uh, fiche was one student, we may have to look at every image just to find, well, when is there, which is a different section within that individual file, which would require potentially image level indexing. So you're going to individual images and finding where is this thing so I can break it up. All right. Ah, fielding. Sure, I added that today because I almost forgot about it. Something with fielding. So there's naming and then there's fielding. So in this case, um, yeah, we can use this. Why not? Let's say we're doing even fiche level indexing. This applies to all types, but let's just say we're doing fiche level. And he said, I want fiche level indexing. Great. As it is, right? Which would be just transcript space, student space, name space, A space, through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Boom, dot PDF. He said, no, I kind of want it. Uh, can you make it? I want the um, first, I want the, the year. I want the year. And then I want the type, like transcript. Then I want student uh, beginning through student end. And then fiche of fiche. That's called fielding. So we're not just saying, I'm going to take this as presented. I'm going to take what's here and then reorganize it. And that's important because that is more, can be more difficult. And so that if it's simple like this, oh, okay, great. Anything that's over here is a doc type. That's clearly student beginning, student end. There's a year. Okay, sure. So this would be called 1975 underscore transcripts underscore. Uh, let's pretend it says Abraham through Delta underscore one of one. That would be a fielded fiche title level uh, index. The difficulty can come about if, let's say there are two, two years on here. And we don't know, well, which one is it supposed to be? Maybe it said fall 1975, uh, winter 1976. Which one do I choose? Is there a rule to say, uh, always pick the first one or always choose the later year? Or let's say transcripts wasn't on the next fiche. So what do we do? Do we leave it blank so it's underscore, underscore, and then goes to the next thing? Do you want us to put something that says empty? Do we put it into a document type just called MISC, you know, miscellaneous? What if a, a, a type pops up that we didn't know about? You say, hey, there's me transcripts, attendance records, grade rosters, and then something else comes up like community service. I don't know. Do you want us to capture that, or is that not one of the files you want? You'd rather have that blank. So little things like that can affect the, the process flow and how we set these up and exceptions and red flags that do occur uh, it's, it's not major, it's more, it could cause a little slowdown or a wrinkle because the more exceptions you have, it's okay, we can't do this one flag and we got to ask, what do you want to do here? Maybe you haven't thought about it and you have to go figure it out. That would slow down. Does it slow down the whole project or can we continue on with the rest of it while we're figuring these out? It's just, it's something that there's always, there's always a nuance that's going to pop up in any project. It's, it's hard to Imagine every scenario, but that's something to think about if you want fielded data specifically. I mentioned just a few minutes ago about subcontractors. And sometimes they have a negative connotation because like, oh, subcontractors, where are you sending my stuff? Subcontractors, at least, I can only speak for BMI. Our subcontractors, we have a number of them, working with for many years. They're vetted. BAAs are in place. We do security audits every year and work with them to get updated information regarding their security. But we've been working with these folks, some for decades. And subcontractors are, in some cases, essential to these types of projects because they help keep costs, they keep our costs down, which means prices to you are typically lower as well. So if you don't want a subcontractor and let's say something that they're doing, we're going to charge you, I don't know, 15 cents to do indexing and we're assuming we're going to use subcontractors we're doing a title indexing maybe some special fragmenting you say I don't, I don't want subcontractors that may be maybe now we have to charge you 50 cents because we have to do it internally it's just more expensive that way so subcontractors can help those, keep those costs down they're great at scale they have a lot of people that focus purely on repetitive and scalable tasks so we don't have hundreds of folks sitting around to do just keying or just looking at images. Subcontractors typically do, so they can take a lot of data, a lot of images, a lot of uh, you know, 
titles and whatever we need to have done. And they can put that scale so they can do it quickly and cost effectively. Again, they are absolutely, so we have long-term relationships with these folks. They're not just new people off the street, every project. We like using recurring subcontractors that we have worked with for a long time. And typical tasks for subcontractors are image framing. So I'll give an, I'll go back and give an example of image framing, but indexing and data entry, document ID. So maybe we have, to, we have to identify a type of document and push it into a certain workflow. They're great at that. And then quality assurance and quality checking. Image framing is, so let's say we are scanning this fiche. Programmatic framing is part of the project. So technology systems, those will try to find these frames, say this is an individual image. It's not part of this image. This is an individual image. This is one, this is one, this one. Occasionally though, especially with microfilm and microfiche, these types of records, you may get variations in the, the, um, the brightness and contrast. Some could be very dark, some could be very bright and just kind of weird looking. That programmatic framing may not capture it. So what we like to do is send illegible low resolution images to subs as part of our step. And they say, they might get these and say, let's, I don't know, there might be 60, 50, 40 images on here or something. They'll see the images and some may, it may show, okay, one was not captured by programmatic frame. They'll go and be QAing that and actually frame that image that was not captured by software or our technology, but they caught it because, you know, humans are very good at certain things. Sometimes they're better than, than algorithms, algorithms and systems. So they'll do that QA and image framing, and crop that and say, no, you guys missed this one. Boom. There's your image. That's good for you because you don't want to be missing an image. So they're great at that kind of, uh, that kind of task. Now, something with subs, we typically assume we will be using them. Uh, if you don't want subs as part of your project, you can absolutely say so. Just expect it'll be a different price for some part of your project because companies like ours, like BMI, I can't guarantee because I don't know every company, but almost I'm 99% sure that every single one of them uses subcontractors in some way. And we're happy to talk about it. We we love our subs. We've worked with them for a long time. We can show all the documentation of how we work with them, our processes, how we keep your data secure, even if we are using subs. So we're happy to talk about them. But if a company says they're not using them, I would I would be suspicious because it's just something that it's very hard for companies like ours where you don't have a, a lot of people to do this type of work. You're kind of focusing on other things, sort of higher level technological things. I'd be surprised if someone said they didn't use them. It's just, it's, they're so common and they're just great at what they do. So don't be scared of subs. Just ask about them. If you're researching companies, even if it's not us, just ask, Hey, how do you work with subs? What part of my project are they going to be on? Why not? It's good for you to know you want that warm and fuzzy for security. Schedule. Schedule can affect your price because, you know, this is your project timeline could be based on a start date or completion date or both. I want to start in the March 1st and I want to be done by, August 31st, or say, I don't know when I, I don't need to be done by a certain time, but I want to start on March 1st. Okay, great. Shorter typically means higher costs. So an example was we uh, recently had a 400,000 sheets of microfiche project and they had a price. I think it was right in the, you know, call it around a dollar. So what, there's some special stuff on it. So it wasn't the lowest pro cost because there's some things they needed that couldn't, we couldn't be below that. But let's say it was about a dollar. And we were given, I think the timeline we had discussed was roughly like eight or nine months, something kind of, you know, a lot of stuff to do each month. But with the other projects we were working on, it was doable and they were fine with that. Well, they came back after we were in negotiation and said, um, actually, we need this done in two months. So this was like, I think it was like late April. We were supposed to start in mid-May. Said, hey, we need it done by, I think it was done by end of June. So let's just say it was like 60 days worth, two months. So we went back, got our team together and started talking. Said, sure. But the price went up like three or four X because it's not just that the schedule was truncated. We, we had the resources to do it. However, this schedule, I'm going to flip right into capacity it affected our ability ability to accommodate other projects. So their schedule came into play. Their project specs were very specific. We do you know a couple things that required some 
some uh, some of our smarter IT folks and software folks to do some clever things. Complexity can affect that. But the internal factors of flexing other projects, we had to talk to some customers and, and sort of, you know, may push off some projects that were supposed to start, or maybe they're supposed to finish sooner. We talked to them and said, can we elongate this a little bit? We had this project coming in, they need it done a certain time. So our capacity to accommodate that client schedule required us to say we can do it, but because of what we have to do to accommodate that schedule, this price is going to be much more than if you gave us our standard, what we had talked about, eight, nine month timeline. They were fine with that. We did it. It was an absolute crunch. Team did great. But that's that's a great example of schedule and capacity plays into effect price. Another factor, let's say I'm giving you a, for fun, a dollar twenty five a fish, and you have eighty thousand fish, and you want to start in June. But you say I'm not in a rush. It's okay if this takes a little longer than usual. Let's say that would be usually let's say eighty thousand fish. You know that would be called from our milestone approval, maybe four or five months on a kind of easy pace, five six months. You say within a year is fine. Okay, great. It kind of turns into filler work where we know we have to do within a year, but we're not rushing anything. And if another project comes into that timeline. We just stop working on yours and put the other project fast pace and get it get it prioritized. That's helpful for us a lot. We like having those filler jobs that if something else comes, we can work on that. And I'm not tied to finishing yours very quickly. That can help lower your costs if that's something you're open to. Just keep that in mind. OCR is optical character recognition, meaning you basically can search your files. So a lot of times this will be priced in and you always say, yeah, I want this project. I want PDFs. I want searchable. We'll just price it in depending on scope. It's one of those things that someone's not sitting there typing every word on a page. It's machine time, but that machine time still requires project manager oversight and project management and the resources, nodes, and systems, and all these different processes to, to get these images OCR and have that text search capability. I mean, think about it. If you have 50,000 jacket fish, let's go on math is right. 50,000 jacket fish, let's say they're all full, 60 images per fish. Yeah, 3 million, 3 million images on just 50 sheets of 50,000 sheets. That's a lot of images. And depending on the quality, the, the density of the text, are there images on there that crash the servers, that crash the OCR? We have to reprocess them and have someone review the exceptions. It does still take a lot of management and oversight to get these done. We've had some projects where it takes a roll of microfilm. I think it was newspaper microfilm, maybe five, 600 frames on it. It was taking a lot. No, this was court film, excuse me. But it was taking like multiple days for one roll to process. So if you think, oh, this is just, hey, you're, no one's doing anything. It's just machine time. It's just a computer thing. It still sucks up a lot of resources. And that's why it's not free to do text search processing. Usually it's baked into the price, but if you don't want it, it could be helpful because it'll process the images faster and you may have a slight reduction in the price. Something to think about. And lastly, there's output. And output is how you receive your project. So scan everything. We put it into a format you like. Well, how are you going to get it? There's a traditional method like PDFs, multi-page PDF, single page, black and white, grayscale. TIFFs as well, that would be the format. Then there's actually getting it, which would be uh, possibly FTP or fired file transfer protocol, which is basically receiving it electronically. We load it to a secure platform to secure material and you get up there, you pull it down. That's one way. USB hard drive, we load it to a drive, send it to you and you plug it in, there are your images. That's what we call traditional because that's what most people think about, you know, PDFs and getting hard drives. We can do DVDs and CDs, don't like doing it anymore. It's just that's older technology. USBs are preferred, but it is possible. Another kind of ties into traditional is your existing document management system. You may say, I need multi-page bitonal TIFFs and I need them loaded in a certain way because I have Highland on base and I need us or uh, I have um Oh, what's the other one? I just completely blanked. Laser fish. We've worked with a lot of these. You say, I need a certain type of file. We can do that and get it taken care of for you. We just load it based on your specifics for how your document management is set up, your system set up so it can be populated in there once we deliver it. It's still going to be delivered FTP or USB, 
but it's just ready for your document management system. So it's kind of like traditional 2.0. Or you may be accessing our digital real system for your fiche, which means we load it directly into our hosted platform as the project's going along, as fiche are processed and loaded, you're accessing them during the project. So you have 100,000 fiche, month one, you may be able to get to 5,000. Month two, there's another 10,000. Month three, now there's another 20,000. So this is our application, secure login. That's a whole different discussion of what's the difference between digital, real, and traditional. But those are the main ways that you can get your actual deliverable, the image to product is the traditional, traditional 2.0 for your system for prep for that or digital real. It's up to you, or you can even do them in combination. Like you may have a doc manager system, but you have digital real as an augmentation or kind of a backup. Different ways to peel the orange, but those are your basic outputs there. And that is the last factor on the nine factors that will affect your fee scanning project. So that hopefully it got you, got you thinking, got you kind of on a baseline, that 90 cent, call, call it a dollar a jacket fiche is roughly where it is in, you know, around $3 for a comm fiche. That's pretty much the, the kind of baseline. And then up or down from there, based on these factors that we just went over. So does anyone have any questions? I'll wait, you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds and uh, see if any questions pop up. I'm happy to answer them here. There'll be some information for contacting on the next slide. If you don't want to ask them now, you want to contact me directly afterwards. So I'll just wait a couple seconds here and see if anything pops up. Nothing yet. That's fine. Uh, must mean I should answer everything perfectly. Fantastic. So this is my direct email. The simple version will it be in my images.com. Absolutely reach out to me if you have any questions or if you have a project you want to just chat about, get some information. And we do have a newsletter. If you have a cell phone on you, just put on the camera, pop it up. If you hover over that QR code, a little thing will pop up. Just click it, fill in your email. Every other week we send out a newsletter with new videos, new articles, webinars coming up, things like that, anything related to digital imaging that we're providing. Great way to keep up to date on digital imaging and technology and what's coming up. So recommend you uh, sign up for the newsletter. Again, I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. You got something out of it and looking forward to hearing from you. And thank you again. Have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday.